everyone, and welcome to the Center for Healthy Sex monthly Mirror of Intimacy series. I'm Dr. Alexandra Katahakis, and today is Monday, March 1st. So I'm excited to talk to you today about intention, uh, which is our topic for uh, our conversation today. As always, if you have any questions about sex, love, or intimacy issues, you can call our intake counselors at 310. 843-9902. And you can type questions into the chat box um, or into the Q&A box, and I'll do my best to answer them as we go along here. So the quote for today says, go out looking for one thing, and that's all you'll find. So go out looking for one thing, and that's all you'll ever find, sorry, uh, by Robert Flattery. And I think that's a really wise thought that if our focus is only on one thing and one thing only, that's what we get. If we broaden our focus or our intention onto other things, we can manifest those things in our lives also. When I look up the definition of intention, one of the things I found was the intention or what one intends to bring about. So think about bringing something about, bringing something to fruition making something manifest in your life, that we have these very powerful human capacities to imagine into and intend into um, being into our lives. Another definition is a determination to act in a certain way. So if I have an intention to get physically fit, that is... Um, a decision to act in a particular way. So I have a resolve to do that. And if we have a resolve to do something, then we can start to put things into action. Another definition is that which is important or significant. So think about what is really meaningful to you? What is important? What is significant? What do you actually value? What do you intend to bring into your life? And also that intention um, as a concept is a product of attention that's directed to an object of knowledge. So a product of intention, think about that. Where is your intention all day, every day? When you stop working, where do you put your attention? Um, is your focus always going to social media platforms? Are you always checking emails or texts? What are you intending for your life? And where do you squander your attention and the ability to manifest into your life what you want? <clears throat> it's important to consider that our intentions are actually filtering our perception of the world. And as Pia Melody is famous for saying, our intentions or our perceptions are our reality. So your perception of the world is your reality and my perception of the world is my reality. And so increasingly we see, you know, in the socio-political landscape globally, that there are multiple realities and it's hard to tell what's real, what isn't, who's telling the truth, who isn't, because our perceptions really do um, create and color what we think to be true. So make sure you're setting your intentions with great care. And this is such a challenging thing because we are not taught to think in this way at all. We're taught actually to unsee things, not to see things. We're not taught to see um, sort of the intricacies of the world as we're growing up. Everything is flattened out more or less. And our challenge is to recognize that we really can set things into motion by way of what our intentions are, <clears throat> excuse me, and ultimately where we're putting our attention. And an example of this is, um, you know, love addicts project their unsolicited, unrequited romantic intentions on their objects of desire who may not share those same uh, reciprocal feelings with them at all. And sex addicts, conversely, um, will sexualize sometimes even the most non-sexual situations because they're looking through at everything through this very narrow and rather traumatized lens. 
So whatever you are looking through, the lens you're looking through, if it's a lens of lack or limitation or love addiction, that's what you're going to get back. And so how do you broaden the lens? How do you start to um, see life in a more open, significant way? So in contrast to setting a healthy intention, um, which means that you're going to formulate and follow a conscious and realistic plan is letting things just sort of happen serendipitously or happen as they happen. And these are two different philosophies or way of being in the world. Um, are we being deliberate? Are we actually following a conscious plan? And I think this is one of those paradoxes uh, where it's both, where if you have an intention, let's say to travel next summer, let's see what COVID brings us, but let's say that's your intention. You can sit and wait and quote, see what happens, or you can get very deliberate about where it is you wanna go. You can buy a book about that country. You can start to learn some phrases in that language. Uh, you can start looking at airline tickets and fares and finding out what the most um, efficient and <clears throat> perhaps least expensive way to get there is for you. And you can start to intend by every day putting your attention on how you're going to do this and making a plan for it. And then you see what happens. Then you see what the universe brings you. So you have to make a plan and also let go at the same time. And these would seem like um, counterintuitive propositions, but actually they're not. They have an equal and opposite value, even though they are counter to each other. And both are necessary. Uh, because if you look at how often you've recruited willpower to get something done, and then your willpower sort of wanes and your re resolution kind of vaporizes, you're left with nothing at the end of the day. So to intend really requires an effective course of action. Um, it requires an attainable purpose. And your intentions can be simple or they can be really complicated. So this last weekend, I had the great pleasure of spending the day on Saturday with 37 amazing women who identified as struggling with love addiction addiction. And all of them struggled with a lot of pain, a lot of childhood trauma, but every one of them had the intention of changing their lives and getting out of these adaptive patterns, these childhood strategies for survival so that they could be more whole and feel more complete. Um, and all of them showed up in their fullness with this desire and intention to change. But without a conscious plan, to move forward, they won't change. And this was really brought home, you know, in our conversations throughout the course of the day, how important it is in recovery circles to have a community of concern, to have a sponsor, other people you can call in the program, people that are really rooting for you to get better, to make these changes, people you can reach out to and make a phone call to, or that are going to come over to your house if you need something. That is actually having a plan to get out of a problem as opposed to hope. And hope is not a plan and it's not a strategy. So this is a, a really good example, a concrete example of what it means to set an intention into action and to recruit other people for that as well. So when you are um, keeping your attention on your intention, then you have to look at all the small actions you can take every day and so how many of you actually set your course for the day every day? Um, you get up in the morning, you barely wake up, you drag yourself out of bed, uh, you walk into your kitchen, maybe you make a cup of coffee or a cup of tea, um, and then you slowly start to wake up as you look outdoors and look at what the day is going to bring. But oftentimes what happens next is that um, an electronic gadget is turned on. Um, and then it's very easy to get sucked into the world of answering emails or seeing what the business day has to bring versus taking a moment to take a couple deep breaths to maybe sit down in silence for just 10 minutes. That's all um, minimum to really calibrate your nervous system for the day. 
to write in your journal for what is my intention for today. Maybe today, because it's Monday, my simple intention is clarity. And the way I'm going to get clarity ultimately is to look at my calendar and to see where my appointments are and who I'm committed to and what my obligations are. Other things that you can do is, you know, make a list of the things you need to do to move your bigger intentions forward. So if you want to take that trip, maybe today is the day that you're going to call someone who's been to that particular country to find out what their experience was like. Or this is the day you're going to look at some books on Amazon and pick the one you think is most resonant for the kind of trip you want to take. But you're doing something or you're making a list of the small measures you can take, the actions you can take to move your intention forward. If your intention is to be in a relationship um, and you're learning to date, maybe it is to start a dating plan or it's to work with a book that helps you get clear about the kind of relationship you want to be in or the kind of sex life you want to have. Um, so take a moment right now to ask yourself, what is my intention? And perhaps you set an intention for 2021. And we can have broad intentions. You know, maybe this is a year to feel positive or to come out of isolation or to restructure the way that you've been working for the last 15, 20 years. Whatever that intention was for 2021, take a moment right now to think about that intention. And have you had your attention on that intention? And then what are the smaller intentions you have that have to do with friends, families, loved ones, um, your home life, your children perhaps, um, furthering your education? What are the things that you want to do to enrich your life that have to do with you and not comparing to others, but what is really, really true for you? So take a moment right now to just jot some of those things down since I'm perhaps jogging your memory at this moment. So there's one question here. What to, do you recommend on how to create a dating plan? Well, there are two dating plans um, in two of my different books, one in erotic intelligence, and then an updated one in sexual reflection. So you'll find dating plans there. Sometimes sponsors have dating plans. Um, the updated version in sexual reflections um, just has some updates around technology because erotic intelligence came out in 2010 um, when people weren't texting that much and now everybody texts. So um, I put some different suggested parameters around that. But it is really about having a structure that you can deviate from. So at least you have an intention about um, what do I do on a first date? What do I do on a second date? What do I do on a third date and a fourth date? When do I start to spend X amount of dollars? Um, when do I spend the night at someone's house? When do I have sex with someone? What conversations do I have beforehand? A dating plan helps you really think everything through intentionally um, so that you have a roadmap of how to get to where you want to go. And you might not do them in perfect order, and it might not happen in that way. Something else might happen, but at least you have a blueprint. And if you were to build a house and you were to construct a blueprint for building a house or an office, uh, you might get you know, a quarter of the way into it and say, oh, I think I want the door facing this way, not that way. Or I want this room a little bit bigger than I thought I wanted it. So the blueprint gives you a foundation from which to work from. And that's how I like to think about dating plans. Not like there's some strident fixed um, regimented thing you have to adhere to, but something that gives you guidance along your journey. And then um, another, um, let's see, question here is, how do we know if we're le leaning more towards the more extreme of the two counterintuitive ways of holding our intention that you mentioned, being deliberate in our intention or going with the flow? Um, I don't know how to answer that for you exactly. I think you have to find a balance. If you find that you're just super rigid about writing down every single intention and um, it's all got to be letter perfect, there's really no room for a flow state in that 
situation. You can't really say, you know what, I've written my intention and now I'm going to drop it and see what happens. Um, the converse would be that um, I decided I want a relationship, so I wrote that down. And now that's all I'm doing and I'm just going to see what happens. Um, so those are imbalanced ways of organizing yourself. There comes a point where you realize that something has to be good enough and you take your hands off of it. And another time where you realize that maybe you haven't put enough work into something um, and that you have some magical thinking going on. So you really have to calibrate that yourself. Um, and also check it out with, you know, trusted others that you have in your life. Uh, like who are your fair witnesses? Who are the people that know you well, that know that you tend more towards overthinking something or you tend towards not doing enough work on something? And they can probably give you your answer. When it comes to love relationships, that's another place where we can um, fall short on our intentionality. Um, we seem to think, and I think this is embedded in our culture, that uh, with the happily ever after myth, that once you're in a relationship or once you're married, you don't really have to do anything anymore. You just kind of cruise along and that's how it goes. And we, we fall into a stupor of thinking we don't ever have to reevaluate our goals or our dreams or our intentions with the partner that we are involved with. And that is part of what creates problems, deep problems in relationships, and sometimes ultimately divorce. And I believe that happens because people are afraid to be vulnerable and real in their relationships with their partners. And so it's important to have an agreement with your partner that you are going to reevaluate your relationship often. You know, maybe it's once a quarter or, you know, twice a year or something like that, where you sit down and you say, so how are we doing? And more importantly, who are you today? Do we still want the same things? Um, and what happens when our intentions change over time because we're human and hopefully part of our vow to each other is to support each other in our personal growth and development. And that may mean that we leave each other. That's how much we love the other person is that we understand that we could grow apart from each other. And the paradoxical willingness to accept that intention ironically has us deeping, deepening our intimacy and our care for each other. So that's actually less likely to happen. But we have to be willing to step out into the truth and um, speak the unspeakable and name the unnameable as a way to give space for possibility to occur. So there's a question here, uh, how long have I, uh, should I make intentions weekly, monthly? Well, it depends on the size of the intentions. I think if they're grand intentions, um, we might want to consider that, you know, if I'm making an intention that I want to get into a relationship, I don't think I have to revisit that large intention every month. But what I do have to revisit is what am I doing to make that manifest? And there's something powerful about writing intentions down and then checking in on them in you know, six weeks and seeing, um, how am I doing here? What's come to fruition? How's this going? I know for myself that I can move things on my to-do list for a long time. So an example of that is I uh, started a workbook a couple of years ago with some of the staff members here at CHS who were very enthusiastic about this particular workbook. And um, it got three quarters of the way done and then it just stalled out because I was super busy. And then COVID came and I thought, great, this is gonna be the time when I finish this workbook. But something else happened during COVID. There was a period um, really in the fall where I just started to feel listless and like I just didn't want to do anything. And I don't know if it was that there was so much built up fatigue and I was so much languishing in the ability to just rest and do nothing that I got just sort of stuck in the nothingness. But whatever it was, I didn't panic about it. I knew I wasn't depressed, but I just felt kind of blah about everything. And really through the holidays, it was like, yeah, I don't really want to put up a Christmas tree. It's too much work. Like everything just felt like too much work. But I still had the intention to finish this workbook. And I kept seeing it on my to-do list and felt you know, a little bad about it because I thought there was not that much left to be done. I was so close to the finish line and I just kept not doing it, but I kept leaving it on my larger intention list. 
because I knew it would get done. And then something happened after the first of the year. And more importantly, something happened really two weeks ago. I took a walk with a friend and I came home and I was so inspired from the talk that I thought, this is ridiculous. I'm finishing this workbook. So I finished it. I contacted a graphic designer yesterday. And so now it's in motion again. And now my attention is 100% on it. And I'm super excited about it. But it took its own time. I couldn't force it. I couldn't make it happen. For whatever reason, I just wasn't interested in it. And because of that, I couldn't write. And this is a way of honoring what is and trusting that whatever's happening right now is what's happening right now. And I'm not going to beat myself up about it um, or criticize myself because I'm sure I accomplished other things, even if it was just hanging out and watching Netflix with my cat and bonding with her. <laughs> that's what had to happen during that time when I was feeling listless. So think about what the smaller intentions are. The smaller one might be something like, you know, this week I want to commit to exercising four or five times this week. And so I'm going to check in on that list every single day. I'm going to check my intentions. Did I work out today? When am I working out tomorrow? What do I have planned for Wednesday? Um, so that I stay on top of it. Um, someone writes here, In the early stages of recovery, a daily intention can easily become a laundry list. Do you have any advice on not getting overwhelmed and holding space for peace and simplicity? Well, yes, I think, you know, it is a one day at a time program. And if on any given day, you can do one thing that you are intending to do. So maybe you have an intention to wake up every morning, meditate, pray, journal, read something from a daily affirmation book. Um, and then during the day, you're going to get to a meeting and call your sponsor and do some step work. That's a lot of intending for the day. And that's why I think recovery is like a part-time job because it takes a lot of time. And so maybe you're not going to get all of those things done and you're really struggling with the morning routine. So if you do one thing in your morning routine, let's say you meditate, but you don't pray or journal or read an affirmation, but you do get to a meeting and you do make a program call. So that's progress, not perfection. And then perhaps you might consider, wow, I really want to look at what my mental block is to getting this morning routine set. How much time do I really need? What's in the way of my doing it? Um, and maybe talking to somebody about it and seeing if you can just figure out a way to do it a couple times a week until you can put it into practice every day. So you have to work with yourself and then look at what is the resistance resistance coming up? And what is your issue around that? Oftentimes procrastination is tied to perfectionism and that's tied to shame because I'm not doing it well enough or good enough, or, you know, I haven't been meditating 20 years. So doing it one time, I feel ridiculous and it's not doing anything yet. So you want to use these blocks as a um, invitation to look at what the underlying issues are for you, because it's all therapy. All of it is mindfulness. It's a therapy practice. All of this has to do with our daily healing and our daily evolution, really. Uh, what would you say about partnerships where reflection and assessment of the dynamics is common, maybe even daily, is this over analytical and damaging or encouraging openness? Well, it depends on how you feel about your partner. Um, does that evoke anxiety for you? Um, do you want to avoid them because they just want to talk about, you know, the relationship ad nauseum? Or does it make you feel more open hearted, more vulnerable, more connected? What is the result of the conversation? Um, a lot of times people can get into these analytical conversations about, you know, the theory of love, but they're not really being loving and they're not really connecting sexually. They're just talking about it. So what is it that you're looking for and what is your intention from these types of daily dialogues and conversations? And are you getting the desired result? Uh, what daily or weekly intentions do you suggest for mother enmeshed sex addicts? 
Well, I would recommend that you take a look at the codependency literature because I don't know that there is a daily book for mother enmeshment, um, but I would direct you to Melody Beatty's book, The Language of Letting Go, which you all heard me talk about before because I really think that book is a winner. Um, and looking at the codependent structures that underlie the enmeshment and how you can on any given day you know, make a move towards taking care of yourself instead of your mother in a way that feels honoring of yourself and knowing that she's not going to die if you don't call her today um, or if you don't do something that you've been doing that really takes time away from you and your own partnership. Um, so do look at that. Um, and I think Melisa has just typed that URL into the chat box. When intentions fail, how do you keep creating them and stay in possibility and believe that the outcome will come to fruition? Well, the outcome doesn't just come to fruition and the intentions don't fail. Our willingness to do the work is what fail. Um, the intention of, you know, I want to get physically fit does not fail. It only fails if I don't do the work to make that happen. And I keep using that because that's a concrete example. Um, but if I want to change my relationship with a sibling or a parent, and that's my intention, it's only going to change if I do the hard work of making that change. If I start to do um, a lot of the codependency work, if I start to put boundaries around when I do and don't call that person, if I am intentional about not calling that person when I'm triggered or angry at them or feeling like a victim or self-righteous, then my relationship and conversation is going to go much more smoothly and be more productive. So what is the work that you're doing? Your intentions will not fall flat if you are actually doing the work to bring them to fruition. Um, I struggle with anxious manic behavior. I bring major decisions to my sponsor therapist men's group uh, before I act on anything, but before I bring ideas to my crew, how can I know the difference between an idea that I'm excited about versus me being in a manic episode? Thank you, Alex, this is a really cool workshop. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Um, well, I don't know what your situation is. When you say manic, that makes me think about, you know, um, unmedicated state. And so I'd have to know a lot more specific information from you about that. But I would think that by now you have a way of recognizing what you're calling a manic state when you have this big grandiose idea. I think it's always useful, whether it's manic or not, uh, when we have an impulse to sit on it for a minute it's like getting an email from someone and they're all riled up and you're freaked out and you think, oh my God, I've got to fix this right now. I have to answer this right now. And that's really the worst thing that we can do. You know, let's say if it's a boyfriend or a girlfriend or, you know, some kind of love relationship, instead of saying, you know what, I'm going to take a beat and I'm going to take a breath. I'm going to reread this thing. If it's a big idea, a big intention, I'm going to, I'm going to write it down. I'm going to look at it carefully. I'm going to sleep on it. I'm going to think about it and really try to get right sized about how realistic is this? And am I actually really going to do the work to make this happen? Or is this just more distraction and busy work for me? And is it derailing me from a project I already have a commitment to that I'm trying to get done and get across the finish line? Because possibly like you, I have ideas all day long. I could be creating um, just a whole world of sexual health ideas and platforms and books and blah, 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 you name it. But who's going to do all of that? There's only one me and I only have so many people that can help me. And at some point that becomes, like you said, a grandiosity. It's just kind of churning ideas as opposed to stopping and looking at what are the orphans on my to-do list, like my little workbook that I just finished, um, that really need to be finished because they're stragglers, they're just being left behind. So that's the broadest way I can think about this for you without knowing exactly what you're talking about. Uh, I'm experiencing acting out urges in my primary sex addiction behaviors. Should I share these with my partner? I would say the answer is no. Or should I just express that I need to recommit to my recovery and seek help in my recovery community, therapists, et cetera? Well, 
yes, you should definitely be in recovery. These are things you should talk about with the sponsor. Uh, they're things you should be talking about in your program and your meetings every day um, and with a the therapist. But if you're in recovery and you're starting to get triggered and you're starting to feel slippery, your partner should not be your recovery buddy. They should not be your higher power. You need a program around you. Um, and this is the purpose of the program. It's like guardrails um, you know, in a bowling alley um, that you never go into the gutter because you always have somebody to call and someone to be current with. And there's nothing wrong with those thoughts or those feelings or those fantasies or what have you. Again, it's the, the acting on them that becomes problematic. And so when you have people to talk about a lot of people so that it's not just one phone call, you've got, you know, five working numbers in your phone. So if somebody doesn't answer, you make the next phone call and somebody does. That's the difference between being, quote, emotionally sober and acting out sexually. So, yes, you should definitely have a program around you and don't torture your partner with the general, you know, jetsam and floatsam that goes through your head on any given day. All right, so I was talking about when we should talk to partners and our intention about talking to partners and why it's so important to uh, be transparent and be real in our relationships so we can keep those relationships going. And it's important to remember that one of the things about being human that's so spectacular and dangerous at the same time is that uh, we are salient seeking creatures. We are always looking for something new and shiny and exciting, and we want to discover new things. And uh, we live in a world that's constantly changing. It never stays the same. So of course you and your life are going to change over time. And, um, you know, especially if you're in recovery and you're on this path of self-awareness, you start to recognize in short order that this is a lifelong endeavor. It's not a one and done thing. And people start getting very excited once they do get solid sobriety about other possibilities they can explore, about other uh, modalities for growth and development, whether they're spiritual or artistic endeavors or creative endeavors. And so you're going to change over time and it's going to happen whether you set new intentions or not. But if you don't set an intention, you're going to end up somewhere. If you set intentions, you're going to send, end up someplace at least akin to what you think you would like for yourself. And it's really hard to do this because we're recruiting these higher cortical functions um, that we often, as I said, aren't taught to use in this way, but human beings have the capacity for vision. We have the capacity for abstract thinking that animals don't have. And you, when you really start to vision or visualize a life, a preferred life, you can bring that into fruition with your actions. And um, when we're traumatized, it's much, much harder to do that because those capacities get dulled. And so if you're struggling with making your intentions happen or bringing them to fruition, it may be because you're exhausted or you dissociate. It's because your system is not fully integrated and you're not firing on all cylinders. So you need more therapeutic work before you can get these major um, endeavors going in your life. And maybe going to therapy is your intention. And so you're gonna make that happen. So you want to really have the courage because that's what it takes, the courage of heart, the courage of vulnerability to envision a life that you'd like to have now and to be bold about it and to not worry about what other people would think or really how threatening it would be to your partner either because it doesn't mean you're actually gonna do it, but you certainly want to entertain it and you wanna have a conversation with your partner about it. So you may be thinking, you know, that you want to move to Hawaii. That's your big, bold intention. And your partner says, wow, that would be really cool and exciting. The problem is I have two elderly parents that live here on the mainland and I'm not ready to leave them yet in case they were to ever need anything. I would never forgive myself. So I can't do that. 
So let's break down what Hawaii means to you. Well, Hawaii means freedom and it means the beach and it's tropical and um, you know it makes me feel alive and I love the ocean. So then let's get together and look at what other ocean type places could we go live at that's within the continental United States. Um, so there may be a compromise that comes up, but if you never talk about your desire for Hawaii and what it means for you, then you're living in this shutdown place. You're not really exercising all of your capacities. You're lying to yourself and your partner, and you'll likely have a resentment about that that your partner won't even know about. So be bold and be courageous in naming what it is that you want and talk to your partner about these hopes and dreams and bold intentions. And see if you can set some of them together. And it may mean that they take you in different directions, by the way, but if you can hold on to the love and the relationship and you can really feel the security of the relationship, even though the two of you go in different directions or you enjoy different things, then that is a real evolutionary prospect, I think. So we have another question here. Uh, how can I learn to reciprocate intimacy I receive? I've been able to accept most of it from my partner, but fa failing to give it back to him, I haven't experienced true intimacy like this before. Well, I would ask you what it is that stands in the way of you reciprocating um, a hug or a touch or him saying, I love you or giving you a compliment. What happens to you? My guess is that you feel shame because shame is typically what stands in the way of reciprocating compliments and giving um, affection and kindness. Uh, we feel like we're not good enough or we're going to be rejected or laughed at or scoffed at. Um, that we're not getting it right. And so you have to look at your own woundedness about being rejected that stops you from being generous because there's a stinginess in not giving that back. Um, there's a, a lack of abundance, if you will, and not being willing to see the other person, to make contact with them, to tell them that you're proud of them or excited for them or that they're handsome or beautiful. Um, and so there's a generosity of spirit that gets dampened down by shame. So I would suggest that you take a look at um, the shame dynamics for yourself um, and to see if that is what stands in your way. So today, see if you can set an intention for yourself and for your relationship and share those with your partner. So if you were to think right now, what is my intention for today? It's Monday, March 1st. Um, we're entering um, movement towards springtime and Easter and Passover and um, the beginning of something new. We often think of spring as a time of rebirth. And so what do you want to birth for yourself today? Maybe it's generosity. Maybe it's giving one person a compliment today, even though that feels so creepy and awkward to me, but I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to screw up my courage and take a deep breath. Um, and that's what I'm going to intend for today. Uh, so what is your intention for this March 1st day? And what one thing can you do to keep your intention on your, um, or your attention on your intention? So I'm going to, um, I emailed my graphic artist, he emailed me back, I'm going to email him back today. That is my intention for keeping my attention on moving my little workbook along. Um, there are other things that I want to accomplish and get done today. And some of those might be as simple as, you know, getting through phone calls that I owe people, that that's my intention is to follow through and get things off my to-do list. Because when I do that, I feel like I had a productive day. I feel like I got something done today. Um, and so there are things that kind of move our life along every day, like returning emails and phone calls. And then there are things um, well, those things are sort of maintain our life, I should say. And then there are things that really move our lives along. And that's where you don't want to get bogged down. You don't want to get bogged down to the maintenance of life every day. You want to find a space to do one thing that moves the bigger things along every day. So take the smallest action that you can for 30 days 
and notice what happens. And when people are sober for 30 days from drugs, alcohol, sex, food, gambling, you name it, in 30 days, they often report that they feel like a new person, that there's a great accomplishment in just one day at a time, setting an intention, doing one little thing to move that, that intention um, towards the finish line, that before you know it, you've accomplished your goal, it's there. So see what you can do. This isn't magic. This really has to do with us putting our best foot forward um, and using our vaunted human powers, which we have, our creativity, our intuition, our capacities um, to create the life that we want. All right. I hope you have a beautiful Monday today. I hope you take one small action towards your intention for the day. And I look forward to seeing you in April.